Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Community Bible Study. My name is Patty Peretti, and today we are talking about John chapter 14. So open up your Bibles, please, and you can follow along with me. Uh, if you don't have your Bible handy, just pull up your phone. You can Google John 14, and uh, I'm, be gonna, I'm going to be reading from uh, the ESV. Let's pray before we start. Father, we thank you for this amazing book. And Lord, we are amazed by the fact that it seems to get more incredible as time goes on. Lord, I ask that you would help us all, whether we are new to it or old to it, uh, to see the glory of Jesus, to wonder and revel in him, and that the truth of this book and the truth of your son and who you are would penetrate us so deeply that it would change our lives. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and that you would teach and that you would change us, that we would be more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Okay, John 14, one through six. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. John 14 addresses one of the most universal problems there is, the problem of troubled hearts. And it's interesting because when you're reading this chapter, um, because Jesus is entirely focused on the disciples and not at all on himself, it's really easy to forget that he would very soon be going to the cross and facing an agonizing death. Jesus himself had been deeply troubled. He said so in 1227. He said, my soul is troubled. And then again in 13. 21 John wrote that Jesus was troubled in spirit. He knew what it meant to be troubled. Uh, but even so, on this night, when it would have been so perfectly appropriate for Jesus to expect some encouragement and support from the 11 who had been his closest friends on earth, he still is the one who gives comfort and encouragement and continues to teach them so that they would understand and not be afraid. He lays aside his own distress and he tends to theirs because they too have troubled hearts. Theirs are confused and uncertain and it is not surprising after all Jesus had just told his disciples in the previous chapter that he was leaving and that where he was going, they cannot follow, at least not now. And what's more, he rocked Peter's world when he told Peter uh, that Peter would deny him three times. So the disciples probably felt like someone had dropped a bomb on them. No wonder their hearts were troubled. When Jesus was troubled, he was distressed at what he was about to face, yes, but he was also distressed about the sinful reality around him. That's what grieved him. But in his distress, he did not sin. He did not spiral into hope-killing kind of 
turmoil because he continued to trust in his father. And his distress did not become what our distress often becomes, a sort of hand-wringing, lost-feeling kind of turmoil and anxiety. And even in the midst of his troubled heart, he still put his distress aside to help, to teach, to support, to encourage his friends. Jesus' troubled heart was very different from his friends' troubled hearts. Now we can sympathize with theirs. I mean, they were about to lose Jesus and they didn't really understand why. They didn't get what was happening. They had spent the last three years doing, walking with him every single day, living life with him. And, and, and that whole thing was about to radically change. The one that they loved and depended on was leaving. And they were confused. Maybe we understand a little more than we used to, how disorienting and unsettling uncertainty really is. For many of you, COVID, uh, life during COVID has, has changed a great deal. Uh, there was some stability, some predictability and security in our structures, in our routines, in the way that we spend our days. I mean, we knew what to expect tomorrow. We knew what tomorrow would bring more of the same. Going to work, driving kids to school, picking them up, making dinner, going to basketball games, cleaning up, taking care of parents, going to doctor's visits, all the stuff of life, all the stuff that we had been doing. And when that changes, then what? the knowing what tomorrow will be like has gone for many of us for a time and uncertainty replaces it. And uncertainty is troubling. It is for us and it was for them. I bet they had a lot of questions. Where was Jesus going? Why was he going? Why won't they let him, why won't he let them come with him? Did they do something they shouldn't have? How, how exactly were they gonna manage life without him? What would life look like now? After having walked with the Son of God, how do you go back to life as it used to be? Jesus' answer to all of that is let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. It reminds me of Psalm 56, three, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. That's one of the verses the children in our little lambs department learn early on, a good verse to learn when you're young, what to do when you are afraid. Notice God doesn't say if you are afraid because you most certainly will be afraid. God knew that. The point is what to do when you are afraid. Trust, believe in God. Jesus is saying to the disciples, you seem to be able to believe in God. If you believe in the Father, you've gotta believe in me. I've been telling you over and over in John's gospel that I and the Father are one. To believe in me is to believe in him. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Now I recently read this whole gospel over again in one sitting, uh, which I highly recommend doing. Because when you do that, certain things really jump out at you. And the union between the Father and the Son is what jumps out at you the most in this book. It is written on every single page and Jesus speaks of it in practically every one of his dialogues. 
He says it over and over and over again. I and the Father are one. Jesus is the radiance of the Father. Believe the Father, believe the Son. So what's the answer to a troubled heart? Believing God, believing Jesus, trusting the one who made us, looking at him and not ourselves and certainly not on our circumstances. I can testify to the effectiveness of that remedy. It is Jesus that has soothed my troubled heart over and over and over again. And he has kept me from diving head first into a pool of sinful self-pity and hand-wringing turmoil. Imagine how Peter must have felt hearing that he would soon deny Jesus three times, especially after his boast that he would lay down his life for Jesus. I wonder if Jesus was looking directly at Peter when he said those words, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. Don't let your sadness, don't let your shame over your future sin or your past sin or your deep disappointment in yourself or in your circumstances, don't let any of it send you into a head spin of turmoil. Believe in me. Keep your eyes on me, not on yourself. That's what Jesus is saying. And he is, after all, very soon facing his own painful death. Yet he is occupied to the very end with loving others. He loved them to the end. And he's reassuring these very upset disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Don't be troubled. Believe what I'm telling you. My Father has plenty of space for you. He goes on to say, If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So here is Jesus' reason. He's giving them a substantive reason for not being troubled. He explains that it's actually to their advantage that he goes. He is not simply saying, cheer up, put on a happy face. Jesus does not tell people to be happy without giving them a real reason to be happy. And here is the reason. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And there's plenty of room for you. But exactly where he's going and how he's preparing, the disciples are not quite sure. We have an image sometimes of heaven that is a little bit off. And our response to these verses uh, reveal what we think heaven is really like. There is no big building project going on in heaven. There was nothing that Jesus needed to hurry back to to oversee. He wasn't managing or supervising the wallpapering of your new house. Nothing physical in heaven needs to be changed. Where is he going? First, he's going to the cross. That is where he prepares a place for you. That's where he secures your place. Heaven is already prepared. It's not unfinished. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 25, 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my Father, 
Inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. I trust you got that last line. Prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Kind of gets to the heart at what we think heaven is all about. Jesus said in verse 3, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. The essence of heaven is the presence of Christ. It's not all about the gold streets and the beauty and the reunion with loved ones or even the absence of pain. It's about the presence of Christ. All that other stuff is great. I look forward to it someday. But heaven is only heaven because Christ is there. He says, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus said in John 12, 32, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself, to myself. That's why the criticism that many people have about the exclusivity of the gospel is ridiculous. People say it's unfair that Christians claim the only way to heaven is through Christ. Well, yes, the only way to Christ is through Christ. That's what he's saying. If you don't want Jesus in this life, it's very unlikely that you'll want him in the next. The problem is the image of heaven that is devoid of Jesus, all beauty and no Jesus. That is no heaven at all. I don't want a heaven where there is no Jesus because of course there is no heaven without him. Jesus is saying here, I am the place for you and I am going to secure a place. I'm going to open that door by going to the cross. He's saying to his disciples, that door is closed to you right now, but I am the door and I am going to open it on the cross. I am going to pay the penalty for every sin that you have ever committed or ever will commit, every bad thought, every self-centered wish, all of it. The wrath of God will be satisfied and the debt will be paid on the cross and the Son of God will triumph over death itself. It is a mind-blowing thought that God satisfied his own wrath in the person of his own Son who was in the beginning with God and was God God himself took care of the problem that the separation between he and us, the problem that, that our rebellion created, that separation between us and God, God remedied it in himself. God satisfied his own wrath with himself. Jesus was about to accomplish what he came to this earth to accomplish, what had never been done before. So he said, let not your hearts be troubled. I am taking you to myself. And then in verse 20, Jesus says, I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. I just want that mind-blowing thought to sort of wash over you for just a minute. Jesus went to the cross to take you to himself, to secure a place with him forever so that we will know and experience what verse 20 says. He says, I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. 
Jesus describes here not only the unity with his Father, he says that in verse 11, I in the Father and the Father in me. He describes unity with us as well. In the same way, you in me and I in you, that is what he is promising, not only in the future, but right here in the here and now through the person of his spirit, the spirit of the crucified and risen Christ. But Jesus concludes that opening paragraph by saying, and you know the way to where I'm going. And then there's Thomas going, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How can we possibly know the way? And Jesus responds, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the sixth of Jesus' I am statements. And Don Carson explains this one so well that I'm going to read parts of what he says. So here I go, quote, Jesus is the way to God precisely because he is the truth of God and the life of God. Jesus is the truth because he embodies the supreme revelation of God. He himself narrates God, says and does exclusively what the Father gives him to say and do. He is God's gracious self disclosure his word made flesh only because he is the truth and the life can Jesus be the way for others to come to know God end quote so Jesus is not leading the way he's not showing us the way he's not pointing to the way he's not talking about the way he is the way Listen to this meditation of Thomas uh, Kempis. He says this, follow thou me. I am the way and the truth and the life. Without the way, there is no going. With the truth, without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. I am the way which thou must follow, the truth which thou must believe, the life for which thou must hope. I am the invaluable way, the infallible truth, the never ending life. I am the straightest way, the sovereign truth, life true, life blessed, life uncreated. That's pretty powerful. Jesus makes another pretty powerful statement in verse 12. He says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Now that's a pretty loaded and complicated statement. Let me break it down for just a minute. What is he actually saying, and what in the world does it mean? He's saying a few things here. First of all, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Second, whoever believes in me will do greater works than I do. Third, he's not talking about Christian superstars. He's talking about everyday simple Christians. Whoever believes, simple believers like you and I. And fourth, he anchors these amazing statements in the second half of verse 12 when he says uh, that the reason we will do the works that he does and greater works is that he is going to the Father. How can that be? Let's think about what Jesus did while he walked here on this planet. He turned water into wine in chapter 2. Um, this is all just happening in John's gospel alone. It doesn't even um, include what happens in the synoptics. He healed the official's son in chapter four, healed a man unable to walk for 35, for 38 years, rather, in verse five, in chapter five. 
He fed 5,000 people with only five loaves of bread and two fish, chapter 6. He walked on water, chapter 6. Healed a, blind, a man born blind in chapter 9. And last but not least, he raised Lazarus from the dead after his body had been decomposing and in a grave for four days. Now that's just to name a few. No one has ever done works like those. And certainly no one has ever done greater works than those, not even his disciples. So what does he mean? When Jesus says that we will do greater works, he can't mean more spectacular works because no one has ever done more spectacular works than these. The works that I do, he, he, he uses that phrase, the works that I do, include his miracles, but are certainly not limited to his miracles. Everything that he did was for the purpose of glorifying his Father in heaven. We understand that. And if you are a believer, you do the same. That's how you live. Verse 11 gives us a little bit of a clue of what he's talking about. A little clarification it says in verse 11 believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe on account of the works themselves so the point of the works the signs is to help us believe the point of the point is believing that's the purpose of the works his works are pointing people to who he is and who his father is. In, in John 17, 4, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, he said, he prayed, I glorified you on earth. He's talking to the father. That's what he's, he, he's summing up all that he has done. I glorified you on earth. That's what he did. That's what every Christian do, desires to do, to glorify Christ to glorify the Father, to point to Jesus, to point to the Father. But what about greater works? What does that mean? Everything Jesus did on this earth up to that point, up to this point, he did prior to his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Every time, for example, Jesus forgave sin on earth, he did so with the anticipation that one day he would fulfill his purpose in coming and he would offer that once and for all sacrifice for sin. He would die on a cross for us. Sin would be paid for and it would be finished. But that had not happened yet. Jesus forgave sin, but he always did so in anticipation of that final sacrifice. When Jesus says you will do greater things, he's referring not to more amazing things, because if the litmus test for being a Christian was that you had to do a miracle as great as Jesus had done, then none of us would be Christians, not one. And the Apostle Paul elaborates on that a little bit in 1 Corinthians 12. He says that not every believer has the gift of healing or the gift of miracles or, or etc. So we know it can't be that. We know that the greater things cannot be reduced to simply more spectacular miracles. Nothing is more spectacular than the idea that sin forgiven and grace offered in the name of the crucified, risen Christ. It is greater than those before Christ was sacrificed because it is finished. The debt is paid. God's plan of salvation was perfected in that it was completed and fulfilled. Greater works will he do, Jesus said, because I am going to the Father. 
Jesus gives us an anchor there and a reason why we will do his works and greater works. It has absolutely nothing to do with us. He gives the reason because I'm going to the Father. That's why you'll do greater works. Jesus was not going to the Father before he had atoned for sin once and for all. That was his purpose in coming. He was going to the cross. He was going to the cross to prepare a place for us, then going to the Father. And the signs and the works that Jesus performed during his ministry did not fully accomplish their purpose until after Christ rose from the dead and was exalted and then sent his spirit, the spirit of the crucified risen Christ the helper. Only after his exaltation could they be fully seen for what they were. Only after his resurrection from the dead could we know for sure that Jesus had victory over death itself, that he had triumphed over Satan. Now, even the disciples who had walked and talked with him every day for three years did not fully understand until after he had arisen, had risen and ascended. We often say they didn't really get it. And yeah, no, they didn't. They didn't really get it, not completely. And if we get it when they didn't, it's certainly not because we're smarter. It's because we have encountered the spirit of the crucified and risen Christ, the one who has triumphed over death. It was the crucified, risen Christ that turned 11 friends who scattered at the threat of danger before the crucifixion into people willing to die for the gospel after it. Because you see, they had met the risen Christ. And that was a game changer. Sin could now be forgiven in the name of the crucified and risen Christ. God's plan had been accomplished that had never happened before. And it is greater. It is new and it is greater. No longer was it necessary to look to a future time when sin would be paid in full. In the same way, Jesus said in Luke 7, 28, among those born of woman of women, none is greater than John, meaning John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Why? Because John the Baptist, while on earth, did not do his works in the name of the crucified, risen Christ. Jesus had not made that final sacrifice. And in verse 16, Jesus promised to send his son, his spirit, the spirit of the crucified, risen Christ. He promised in 18, this is what he said, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. You hear what he said. You will see me because I live. In that day, he's talking resurrection. In the day that you see that I am risen, then you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. The implication is that they did not know before. Seeing the risen Christ will cause them to know. And that is greater. I'm praying that the risen Christ will cause us to know cause us to know that Jesus is in the Father, we are in him, and he is in us.
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your words. May every single one of us, Father, know. May we believe that the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father, that Christ is in us and we are in him. May we know the spirit of the crucified, risen Christ. In his name, amen. Take care. Thank you. See you next week.